Hello there, and welcome to this video in which I want to discuss Adele Goldberg's new book, Explain Me This, Creativity, Competition, and the Partial Productivity of Constructions. So the fact that you're watching this video tells me that you probably know a thing or two about construction grammar. You probably know who Adele Goldberg is, but just in case you don't, uh, Adele Goldberg is one of the leading linguists of our time. Her work has had a tremendous impact on linguistics in general, but specifically on the development of construction grammar as a theory. So it's exciting to have a new book by her in 2019. Right, so it all started, if you like, in uh, 1995 uh, with her dissertation on argument structure constructions, uh, sentence patterns that involve a verb and then several nominal structures that are organized around that verb. And the, the main idea that this book worked out um, for the first time is that these patterns actually have meaning. Yeah? So, for example, the ditransitive construction conveys the idea of a transfer. And uh, that's an inspiring idea that has inspired lots of research and continues to inspire a lot of research in other domains. Okay, then in 2006, uh, Goldberg did it again and, and published a monograph with the title Constructions at Work, the Nature of Generalization in Language. And this book kind of marks the beginning success of usage-based construction grammar, the idea that language use really leaves a strong impact on your memory of language and your representation of language. And um, this usage-based outlook is also reflected in her updated definition of what constructions are. So the idea that usage frequency is important is right there in her definition of constructions. <clears throat> so that brings us to the new book, uh, Explain Me This. And of course, we have lots of questions, right? So will we get a new definition of constructions? Um, Will this book be as powerful in its impact as the preceding uh, two other books? Yeah, what's this book about anyway? Explain me this. That's kind of a weird title. Yeah, to those of you who are not native speakers of English, explain me this is actually ungrammatical. It's something that uh, native speakers of English find very odd. Explain this to me. That's fine. Explain me this is kind of odd. And the question actually is why. Is it so odd? Yeah, this, is, this brings us to the main topic of this book, uh, what Goldberg calls the explain me this puzzle. How is it possible that speakers of a language accept certain utterances that they've never heard before as completely okay, completely idiomatic, and yet they reject other utterances that they haven't heard before either as impossible and ungrammatical? How do you do that? Yeah. So, for example, let's take two sentences here. Vernon tweeted to say she doesn't like us. Perfectly unremarkable. Perfectly okay. Uh, she considered to say something. Now that's weird. Yeah. So, the explain me this puzzle tries to come to terms uh, with this phenomenon. How is it that we like some things but really don't like other things? It can't be because we've heard these things before. Yeah. All of these are new. So familiarity can't be the explanation. It has to be something else. Right. So that's the puzzle that this book tries to address and to solve. And uh, Adele Goldberg actually has two main ideas that she proposes in terms of a solution for the explain me this puzzle. The first one uh, is what she calls coverage. And that idea relates to the mutual similarity between different instantiations of a construction. If I hear several instances of a construction, how similar are these instances to one another? Coverage. The second idea uh, is statistical preemption, and this relates to competition between different constructions. So a language very often gives speakers the opportunity to say the same thing in different ways, and then speakers have the choice. Yeah? So in your mind, there are different ways of expressing a certain idea. And you can see this as a kind of competition, as a kind of race between uh, constructions that can express the same thing, but only one of them can get chosen. Yeah? OK, so coverage and statistical preemption will come back to these. They are the important elements to uh, the explain me this puzzle. <clears throat> the book as a whole 
has eight chapters. There is an introduction that sort of lays out uh, uh, explaining this puzzle. Then there's a chapter on word meanings, which Goldberg argues are actually very similar to constructional meanings. Um, then chapter three gives a basic introduction to uh, the main ideas of construction grammar. And then chapters four and five are really the, the main body uh, of the book. Uh, chapter four, with the title Creativity, uh, is really about coverage. And chapter five, um, with the title Competition, is really about statistical preemption. Um, yeah, as an aside, this is kind of weird. Yeah? So the, the title, if you look at it, Creativity, Competition, and the Partial Productivity of Construction, um, the book isn't really about creativity and not about competition either. It's these two concepts, coverage and statistical preemption. And I don't really understand why the title doesn't reflect this. Uh, my hunch is that someone in the marketing department of Princeton University Press said, look, you cannot have statistical in the title. Um, no one will buy that. Yeah. Anyway, um, don't let it confuse you. It's okay. Um, then chapter six uh, discusses a bunch of uh, age effects, uh, uh, things that happen in acquisition and also effects of L2 acquisition, transfer effects. And then um, just before the conclusions, uh, Goldberg remembers, oh yeah, there were also a few other people who worked on this. Uh, let me briefly explain why their accounts aren't as successful as my own. Um, okay, and then in eight we have some conclusions. So I want to go through each of these uh, eight chapters uh, briefly. As I said, uh, chapter one covers the explain me this puzzle, uh, but additionally also um, summarizes Adele Goldberg's outlook on language, for which she creates a nice acronym. She calls these ideas the sense me principles. So sense me, the letters uh, stand for different ideas. Uh, C obviously stands for constructions. E stands for expressiveness, so speakers have ideas. And they look for linguistic means of getting those ideas across, yeah, to um, turning an idea into language that can then reach someone else. Uh, N stands for new and old information and the management of new and old information. This is information packaging, if you like. Uh, C stands for competition, so that's part of the statistical preemption uh, story. E stands for efficiency, so that comes into play, for example, when kids uh, simplify uh, linguistic uh, input <clears throat> uh, to be efficient. M stands for the usage-based idea of vast linguistic memories that speakers form. And E stands for error-driven learning, so this again uh, fits into the statistical preemption uh, story because when I expect the speaker to say something and they say something else, my expectation is sort of uh, not met and that causes me to reflect on them. Yeah? So that causes me to learn, if you like. So, ooh, my expectation didn't turn out, so I probably have to adjust a few values in my mental network. Right. The sense me principles, they're in principle in line with um, usage-based linguistic ideas, with functional cognitive ideas, but they nicely spell out these ideas in very specific terms. So we know what Adele Goldberg uh, thinks about language in the year 2019. Okay, moving on to chapter two about word meanings. Um, as I said, Goldberg takes this slight detour because she argues that word meanings are very similar to constructional meanings and can teach us something about how constructions are processed. So the basic ideas here are that word meanings are rich, broad, and extendable, so that existing words are used for new concepts if the context uh, requires it. So for example, the people that you're connected with on Facebook, they're called your friends, even though some of them you probably never met in person or only once. Yeah? Um, I think I'm even friends with uh, people who aren't people. I believe I'm friends with my own university, which is weird on so many levels. But anyway, let's not get into that. Um, another aspect is that children overgeneralize word meanings and then backtrack and narrow them down. So for a certain amount of time, 
all animals are dog or bow wow or something like that and then uh, the, the meanings get narrowed down gradually and Goldberg argues that something very similar goes on with constructional meanings. Chapter 3 on constructions is basically a very brief, very short introduction to the main ideas of construction grammar as they were laid out already in her 1995 book. So the idea is that syntactic forms carry meaning. The idea is that there are sometimes mismatches between lexical meaning and constructional meaning that yields coercion effects. When I say three beers, please, yeah, so that means three glasses of beer, something like that. Yeah, not Beer is usually a mass noun, so it's not countable, but I can make it countable by adding a plural marker. That's called a coercion effect. Also, the third idea, uh, constructions are organized in a large network. There are inheritance links, there are subpart links, there are all these kinds of things. Okay, if you're familiar with uh, construction grammar as a theory, then you can probably just skip chapter 3. <clears throat> um, the more important stuff really comes after chapter 3, starting with chapter 4 on coverage. So, as I said earlier, coverage uh, that relates to the degree of mutual similarity between different instantiations of a construction. Uh, maybe I need to backtrack a little bit here. So the foundation, the basis for this is that speakers have a highly detailed linguistic memory of the things that they've said and the things that they've heard, and they continually update this record of linguistic knowledge. So new usage events are categorized in terms of the categories that I already have and uh, they are integrated into my old memories and that gives them the chance to change those categories. Yeah? So uh, let's say I have a detailed memory of the ditransitive construction and then I hear a new ditransitive construction with give that sort of falls right into the center of my category that will strengthen the existing category that I have. But then someone else comes along and uses a weird example of the ditransitive that sort of falls outside the center of the category so that I now have a data point that forces me to extend my existing category a little bit. Yeah? So this is the idea that is relevant for coverage. And now Goldberg argues that coverage is something that helps us understand why certain constructions are productive and others aren't. Yeah? And to understand this point a little better, I've given you a visualization here of um, two uh, fictive speakers that have uh, both learned a construction, let's say the English construction with the suffix ness, as in fairness or sweetness. Yeah? But these two speakers have learned different types of that construction. So speaker one has learned uh, gentleness, friendliness, illness, sickness, and queasiness. So we have two clusters that are semantically very tight. Yeah? Gentleness and friendliness are about being nice. Illness, sickness, and queasiness are all about being you know, ill in some way. Um, so this would be called uneven coverage. Yeah? We have two clusters and they're not very similar to one another. Uh, even coverage would be exemplified by our second speaker here, who has learned gentleness, sweetness, sickness, stubbornness, and fairness. Yeah, so all of these uh, adjectives, uh, sick, stubborn, sweet, they uh, don't have too much in common, and they're roughly equally far away from each other. Yeah, so the degrees of mutual similarity are the same, rather than being different. Yeah, so with gentleness and friendliness, we're very strong similarity, but with gentleness and illness we have very um, yeah, vague or low similarity. Even coverage in Goldberg's account um, facilitates uh, the productivity of a construction so that you can easily come up with new types. In uneven coverage that is not so. Right, so that's uh, coverage. <clears throat> uh, so when there is a new type emerging, yeah, let's say the speakers come across the new word carelessness, <clears throat> the speaker who has these two tight clusters will not quite know what to do with it. Yeah? So the uh, new type falls into an area that is not well covered at that point. But our second speaker, yeah, here the 
new distances in terms of similarity between the types are all roughly equidistant and so that integrates rather well into the existing network uh, or the existing category that this construction uh, represents. Okay, um, the second important factor for the explain me this puzzle is what Goldberg calls statistical preemption. This is an idea that she's been working on in a couple of published papers, so you're probably already familiar with that concept. Um, there are a couple of ideas that are central to this as well, namely the first, uh, that speakers form generalizations over sets of functionally similar constructions. So if I, as a speaker, know the ditransitive construction and the prepositional dative construction, I know that they can be used to express the same idea. Yeah? And I sort of form a supercategory that includes both of these constructions. Um, my doctoral student, former doctoral student, uh, Florent Perec, has worked on this. There's actually good psychological evidence for these um, super generalizations that include several constructions. Okay, that's one idea. The second idea is that speakers keep track of the frequencies of lexical elements that occur in these constructions. So as a speaker, I keep memory traces of the verbs that I hear in the ditransitive construction, and I also keep memory traces of the verbs that I hear in the prepositional dative construction. And I take note of any conspicuous asymmetries between those. Yeah? So this is where explain me this would come in. As a speaker, I have very detailed memories of hearing explain in the prepositional dative construction. Yeah? Could you explain this to me? Uh, but I now when I check my memory base, there are virtually no instances of explain in the ditransitive. So whenever I note an asymmetry of this kind, I infer that you know this must happen for a reason. You know, speakers must have their reasons not using explain in the ditransitive. And this is the phenomenon that Goldberg calls statistical preemption. I want to show you a quick uh, example of one of the studies that uh, Goldberg did um, was together with Jeremy Boyd, so let me make this large. Uh, if you want to do the experiment, just you know, get a piece of paper and write down what happens. You can pause the video now. Uh, I will continue in three, two, one, zero. Let's see what happens. So we see two cows and a star. Uh, and these cows are labeled with the ac uh, adjectives ad active and sleepy. And, whoa, it looks like the active cow moved to the star. <clears throat> so here we have two squirrels. Um, they're described by adjectives. Uh, so this one squirrel is chammy and the other is zoopy. Now you write down what happened. Okay. We have two lizards, or at least lizard-like looking creatures. Um, one of them is Zeji, the other is Adax. <clears throat> Those are not names. Those are adjectives, right? Uh, so let's see what happens. Okay. Um, two kittens. One is awake, the other is tired. Here we go. Right. Um, <clears throat> So here we are again. Um, you can probably figure out what this experiment was all about, yeah, with um, <clears throat> uh, the sleepy cow, uh, we would say the sleepy cow moves to the star. With the chammy squirrel, we would say the chammy squirrel moved to the star. Here we have a cow that's vigilant and one that's asleep. If uh, this cow moves to the star, a speaker of English would say, well, the cow that's asleep uh, moves to the star. And the crucial condition is here uh, where we have Adax and Zeji. So what do speakers say here? Do they say the Adax lizard moved to the star or the lizard that's Adax moved to the star? If they say the lizard that's Adax, then that is because they have a category of so-called A adjectives that do not occur um, in uh, the attributive um, <clears throat> uh, syntactic slot. Yeah? So you cannot say the asleep cow or the awake kitten or anything like that. Yeah? And um, well, it turns out that in this study, um, 
Boyd and Goldberg actually could observe a main effect of uh, adjective type in that A adjectives, so things like awake or um, <clears throat> uh, asleep, <clears throat> they were typically used with relative clauses. The cow that's asleep moved to the star. Um, and there was a main effect of familiarity in that uh, real adjectives <clears throat> uh, were more reliably used with this relative clause uh, strategy, whereas these made-up adjectives like a dax and a blim and a fax, or I, I don't know, uh, their speakers were more likely to just use them as any other adjective. Yeah, So the a dax lizard moved to the star. Uh, thirdly, there was an interaction of adjective type in uh, familiarity, in that unfamiliar A adjectives were used less often with relative clauses than familiar A adjectives. Okay, um, right, so that's statistical preemption. Uh, the things that you know about a construction <clears throat> and how it sometimes is used instead of another construction, that influences your choices. Okay, moving on then to chapter 6, uh, where Goldberg discusses age and L2 effects. So the, the main ideas there uh, come from the literature on language acquisition, the usage-based literature on language acquisition, that is Mike Tomasello's work, Elena Levin's work, um, that type of stuff. So for instance, the idea that children use argument structure constructions very conservatively, uh, that is uh, an idea that Tomasello, for example, calls the verb island hypothesis. That is something that comes into play here. Um, <clears throat> um, with regard to L2 learning, Goldberg points out that statistical preemption may not work as well in second language learners because they already have some knowledge from their L1 that may um, make it more difficult to see these conspicuous asymmetries in how two constructions are used. Yeah? So I, as a German speaker, have heard uh, the <clears throat> word that corresponds to English explain in German ditransitive constructions a lot. Yeah? So I might not even notice that explain is sort of conspicuously absent from the ditransitive. And so that would make it easy for me to make that error and say something that sounds unidiomatic to a native speaker of English. Okay, um, chapter 7 then comes to alternative accounts, other proposals that have been put forward with regard to the explain me this puzzle. Um, there are basically two flavors that Goldberg discusses, one from the more generative um, side of things. Yeah, so she discusses early work by Steve Pinker, which is now 30 years old, and yes, we have moved on. Uh, but also more recent work by uh, Charles Young, who has a book uh, that he holds into the camera there. It's called The Price of Productivity. And in that book, he develops two principles that are meant to explain the same kind of phenomenon. Yeah? When do people generalize and accept a novel utterance, and when do they not generalize and view something as completely ungrammatical? So the two principles that he comes up with are called the tolerance principle and the sufficiency principle. The tolerance principle states mathematically, precisely, uh, how many exceptions a rule can have, and the sufficiency principle states how many regular cases out of a grand total of uses of a construction uh, do we need to observe. Yeah? Goldberg is, uh, to my mind, astonishingly critical of this. Yeah? So all of this, I think, could be uh, co-opted for a more functional usage-based approach, but Goldberg is more like, nah, doesn't work. I don't like it. So uh, I guess the best idea would be to see for yourself if you can check out a copy of uh, The Price of Productivity, How Children Learn to Break the Rules of Language. Now, isn't that a cool title for a book? Um, have to hand it to him here. Um, yeah, see for yourself uh, what you can get out of that book. Uh, the other accounts are more from the cognitive linguistics uh, community, construction grammar inspired. So there's Anatol Stefanovic's idea of negative entrenchment, which is very similar to um, statistical preemption, except it doesn't hinge on this um, category that 
generalizes over two competitor constructions. Yeah? Uh, ben Ambridge has very similar uh, proposals and Ben Ambridge actually has psychological work that tries to uh, distinguish between, well, uh, do we really need a competing construction or is it enough to, let's say, uh, account for the overall frequency of the verb explain and the frequency of the ditransitive construction. Yeah? So, as a speaker, if I've observed explain a lot in general language use, but yet I haven't seen it any, um, I haven't seen it at all in the ditransitive, is that asymmetry enough for me to conclude that it's ungrammatical in the ditransitive? Um, again, Goldberg is kind of critical of, of this idea and doesn't really like it all that much. I don't think um, statistical preemption and negative entrenchment are that different from each other conceptually, but maybe that's me. You know, you can look into these and, and see what side of the argument you prefer. All right, uh, that brings us to the final chapter, the outlook, in which Goldberg basically just uh, you know, rounds out the discussion uh, discusses a few new directions for construction grammar, like pay more attention to conversational and multimodal data, uh, take typological research seriously, talk to the computational modeling guys. Yeah, so all of these are current frontiers of constructional research, and I agree. Yeah, so those are the things to look out for. Right, um, so there you have it. Uh, explain me this. Um, what do I think of the book? I enjoyed it. Um, I think these two ideas of coverage and statistical preemption, it's really useful to have this kind of overview uh, in this book. Yeah. Um, the two ideas have been discussed separately by Goldberg and her collaborators in a lot of journal articles, some of which I've read, some others I hadn't. Um, but there's really a surplus value of having this discussion in the book where Goldberg really contextualizes uh, these insights and you can sort of get her picture, her, her big picture of how she views this issue of productivity and the explain me this puzzle. There are a few things that I don't like as much about the book. So the one thing I already mentioned with the title, creativity competition, it should have been coverage and statistical preemption, really. Um, well, there are, there are other things that I don't quite understand. Uh, so the organization of the chapters is kind of weird. Um, why do we have the age effects and the other accounts sort of as an afterthought at the end of the book? And why is this not part of the preparation uh, that, that sort of builds up suspense until you get to the solution of the explain me this puzzle that I just didn't understand at all? <clears throat> and uh, another thing that I found slightly confusing is that this book kind of looks like a, a book that you could find at an airport shop, you know, for a general audience. And the keywords here, creativity, competition, that all suggests to me that this is kind of for a lay audience. And in the preface, Adele Goldberg says that this is a book for students and teachers. And OK, it's also for researchers. Look, everybody except the researchers will have a bloody hard time with this. Uh, there are Bayesian uh, formulas in here that you need to work through. So good luck. Yeah. Um, that said, you know, I've, I've read this basically as a follow-up of um, <clears throat> her um, journal articles. And for that, it does a really great job. So I can only recommend it. Uh, Get a copy, uh, read it. It's not very long, some 190 pages or so. So uh, Adele Goldberg really does her readers a favor here by keeping it short. Um, if you know about construction grammar, if you know about uh, the main ideas of usage-based linguistics, uh, you can easily process everything that she explains. And she does it really well. Yeah. So Adele Goldberg is one of those writers that uh, really um, make it easy for you as a reader. So for me, uh, five stars, uh, except for these little uh, nitpicky details that I've mentioned. And uh, yeah, I've actually learned a great deal from this book. So I hope you do too. Um, that's it for today. Um, okay, see you. Bye.